Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show, and today another watch jewel. Now, if you remember, a few weeks ago, I recently acquired this uh, magnificent little Tudor uh, Oyster Prince date day. This is the 76200. You guys know I adore Tudor, and I just had to have a Tudor back in the collection. But rather than reviewing it, I thought it would be far more interesting uh, to compare it to my wife's Datejust, the Rolex uh, 16233. So the Tudor is from the early 2000s and the Rolex Datejust is from the 90s. As you guys know, I have a fondness for Datejusts. I've owned many of them and I do feel they are one of the most versatile, actually the most versatile luxury watches around. And if you had to have just one luxury watch, it'd probably be the Datejust. Now, before we get into this particular video, I should, of course, do wristwatch check. There it is my Seiko SKX007, but this is my modded version, King Panther, I've started calling it, uh, due to its black tactical look. I had it modded by my good friend, Watchmaker 4. Um, yeah, I didn't really wear it that much in Switzerland, so I thought I'd pop it on today and enjoy it. Um, so there we go. Now, if you're not familiar with the Jewel videos, uh, there are basically 10 categories as you see here, and I mark them out of 10, and then at the end I give them a score uh, out of 100, obviously. Feel free to keep score as I go down. This is totally in my opinion, so please feel free to share your final scores in the comments below. I'd be really interested to hear uh, what marks you gave these watches. Now, the categories are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the only ones I should kind of point out is style and design. Design is more how it's uh, designed it to, for its intended purpose. And style is, of course, aesthetics. Uh, so let's commence with the jewel. Uh, and I should point out in the red corner or in the right, we have my wife's beautiful Rolex uh, Datejust. There we go. Absolutely stunning, 36 millimeter, that's the 16233. And then of course we have my Tudor Prince Date Day there on the left in the blue corner. And I'm using the London Tube map just because it's the perfect size and it's uh, horology related because of that beautiful gilt gold dial, sorry, uh, gold clock there with the, um, I love how the pendulum is incorporated into the tunnel there of the, um, the subway very cool indeed anyway let's uh, let's commence so the first category is of course value uh, now in my opinion the rolex kind of nips slightly ahead here they do tend to keep their value a little bit better than tudor rolex has that world recognition instant uh, bankability the date just is always going to be in demand it is a hugely iconic watch it's one of the few brands that you could possibly say is a, is a safe investment although i i really um personally I'm, I'm not into investing in watches but rolexes do have that instantly tradable dependability the date just especially especially is one of those kind of trusted models. You can never really go wrong with a Datejust, but yeah, very close to 10. The Tudor, on the other hand, lags a little bit behind. It um, still does very, very well on the used market, but I still think it gets a strong eight because the Tudor is actually almost half the price of this particular Datejust. The Datejust I bought for my wife, and I'm quoting prices. Uh, the time of this video is, uh, late 2017, so you can get this particular date just for around or under the $4,000 mark. The Tudor is about half the price, although you'd also get the added complication, and that's why I'm, I'm still getting giving it a strong eight. They do retain their value pretty well, uh, so I have to also give it um, a decent score for that. Uh, at the time of this video, I paid, I think it was about 1700 1600 1700 on the used market. You'll pick them up roughly around the $2,000 mark, especially from the Japanese market. So let's move on to design. Now, the Tudor kind of uh, lags a little bit behind here, mainly because the design, this particular version or this particular reference, really is completely inspired by the Rolex Day Date. 
It doesn't do anything to differentiate it dramatically from the Rolex line, and I think its scores suffer slightly there. Although, for its intended purpose, the only thing, you know, a 7 is still a great mark. As a day date, it's a wonderful complication, and it functions very legible. You have all the benefits of the Oyster case and all the rest of it, and I have put it on a Jubilee. That's just my preference. The standard bracelet is quite kind of Jubilee-esque, if you see there. Uh, and, and that's probably the only thing that, that is done slightly different um, from the uh, Rolexes. So the design suffers, I, I feel, a little bit. Um, although, if I just pull in this catalogue, this is a catalogue I bought from Harrods, the Tudor have moved the day dates into what they call, they actually call it the Glamour now. And they've changed it slightly, they've updated it. Um, it's a little bit more its own thing now. Essentially, as you see there, keeping that day day layout. The case is a little bit more curvy. And I think that's what Shooter is doing now. It's not piggybacking so much on Rolex. If you see here, there is a white dial version. They've updated the size to 39 millimeters now. And they're marketing it actually towards women especially now and as we've seen in recent years the rejuvenization and redesign of tudor is becoming more of its own thing rather than being constantly in the shadow of rolex has changed the brand dramatically the black bays and the north flags and the, all the rest of them are, are evidence of this i think the design here is still stuck in the past a little bit certainly lacks the originality that um, so definitely distinguishes the date just. The Rolex gets a, a respectable eight. It's very much unchanged, and I feel that's what keeps it the score at an eight. You could say it's, it's you know, why change something that's um, so iconic? The design has kind of evolved uh, with more updated materials and better movements. Essentially, it stayed extremely faithful to the original. This is the fluted bezel version with the champagne dial to me i think it's the probably the, the most quintessential date just when i think of date just this is this is what i envisage um so i i give it a really strong eight i feel it only loses some marks because it it's um you could criticize it in saying it hasn't uh, it's rested on its laurels perhaps but does it does it need to prove anything more i guess that's a whole nother debate anyway let's move on to movement and again we get a solid solid nine here for the rolex so the rolex we'll discuss first it has the 3135 which of course is an in-house uh, caliber automatic of course we get the quick set it's a 31 jewel movement with an impressive 48 hour power reserve it's one of my favorite rolex movements you'll see it in the submariners in the sea dwellers in the yacht masters um, in the date just and the date just two in fact it is a wonderfully relied upon movement first introduced in 1988 extremely rugged and dependable of course it has the date complication it's hackable we have a hand of one I love the, the 3135, it's, I've owned it many, many times, and it is, of course, COSC certified, so you get the performance and the accuracy. You couldn't ask for anything better. Almost a 10, I, it's, it's almost the perfect movement, very well deserved. The Tudor, on the other hand, also automatic, and I must say they both operate at 28,800 vibrations an hour. A wonderful movement too, it's based on the ETA 2834-2, and this is the main difference, or one of the key Key differences in Tudor and Rolex. Uh, Tudor was intended as a more affordable version and thus they rely more on ETAs. Uh, so it's not in-house but you get that ETA robustness and affordability when it comes to uh, servicing and if you need to um, replace any parts. It's far more affordable and I think that's probably the only thing stopping the Rolex getting a 10. So the Tudor is decorated, however it is not COSC certified or chronometer certified like the Rolex. We have a hand of winding, of hackable. Also the power reserve is 38 hours uh, rather than 48. Uh, it's 25 joule movement. Uh, we do have quick set on both the day 
and the date, which is really nice, that beautiful snappy change. So a really solid eight. So let's move on to brand, history, and prestige. And without a shadow of a doubt, Rolex gets a 10. What can we say that we haven't said about Rolex a million, million times? They just are um, such an iconic brand, respected on so many levels, and they're instantly recognizable. But it's not that, in my opinion, that gets a 10 here. We've got to remember that the date just is hugely significant for Rolex and it's one of Rolex's if not the most popular Rolex of all time. Uh, it was released in 1945 for the 40th anniversary of Rolex. Hugely important because it was the first automatic watch with automatically changing date. In the 40s that was a game changer. Massively important. And I know sometimes people criticize it for having the Cyclops at the three o'clock. It was added a little bit later I think in the 50s. Uh, and I did do a video all about the history of the, the, the date just. I'll leave a link in the description. Do check it out. Winston Churchill was given one. It's, it's got a, an amazing history. And I do feel that it has to have the Cyclops. I know it's an acquired taste. Some people don't like it. But it is very indicative of the watch and, and highlights its key historic feature of that date, that automatically changing date. So you couldn't ask more for a watch, 10 out of 10, without a shadow of a doubt, um, hugely important. So the Tudor Day Date, on the other hand, doesn't have any firsts to its name. It relies really quite heavily on the Rolex legacy. Uh, Rolex started selling the Day Date in 1956 and was only available in precious metals. It's become hugely recognizable and historic in its own right uh, and nicknamed the present, often worn by so many uh, world leaders in particular. It's seen as the captain of industry watch. Uh, and later in the 1960s, Tudor released the date day uh, to its lineup in stainless steel and two-tone only. This to differentiate it from the Rolexes and also making it more affordable. So it wasn't really a, a first in any particular way. So I think it gets an eight. It still has that Rolex DNA in it. And I think what keeps the Tudor with a solid eight is also the fact that it's become a, an enthusiast brand. I like the fact that it's not a Rolex. It's It's got its own identity now and it's getting stronger by the year as Tudor becomes a stronger force to be reckoned with, less kind of ubiquitously Rolex inspired watches. They really have flourished in the last few years. So as Tudor becomes more de desirable, I do feel that um, these older models will be uh, more desired too. So a solid eight, all the same. And you can never, never call that a homage because of course, it's still part of the Rolex family. So and respectable eight. Let's move on to quality. Now, I gotta say, I think the, the Rolex slightly nips ahead here. Uh, obviously, we've got precious metals being used in the two-tone here. It really does come down to uh, the materials. A Rolex uses 18 karat gold, although obviously you can get completely stainless steel, but even the steel, they use their own steel as well. And of course, the movement being in-house. So I think the quality is there because they're controlling it from start to finish, from the raw materials to the finished product. You couldn't really ask for better quality. And I'm not saying they're perfect. They, they do suffer from QC issues like anything. I mean, there is no such thing as perfection, but Rolex, uh, even with older models, one of the strongest quality controls out there. When you buy a Rolex, the polishing, the edges, the attention to detail, the way everything lines up um, is always uh, exceptional. God, I, I, I've lost count how many Rolexes I've owned over the years, but I've never ever experienced anything, you know, tantamount to what I would say is bad quality. I, it does happen, of course. I've, I've seen even uh, rehort on Submariners misaligned. Uh, it, it happens to the best of them. But generally, you can rest assured that the Rolex quality is outstanding. Tudor, on the other hand, I, I think is, is up there as well. I, I get the same feeling, the same crisp edges, the same attention to detail. The placement of everything always lines up, for me at least. There are some little corners cut, for example, the hollow end links and, you know, the, the 
fold over clasp there is, is not uh, the most cutting edge. But then again, you could say the same thing about the 90s uh, Datejust there. Rolex is just as guilty as this, although obviously in recent years, their clasps and their bracelets, even the, the Jubilee, which is notoriously jingly jangly, which I actually like, they've made uh, vast improvements. Um, so the quality really does rub off uh, all that uh, knowledge, experience, craftsmanship, and, you know, they share a lot of the same parts. That's why I'm comfortable putting a, a Rolex bracelet on a Tudor. You'll see in the older Tudor I had, it was even signed Rolex on the crown. So they do share a lot of parts, and in some cases, they're manufactured in the same factory. Style, let's move on to style now. Well, basically due to the sheer amount of versions you can have of the date just you can have the most blinged out ostentatious flamboyant ridiculous you know diamonds everywhere pink dials um every color under the sun with different patterns from linen dials to a tuxedo dial to different numerals there's just so much variety i think stylistically you can really get that one that that suits your style and 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 expresses your taste. The champagne dial, you could almost say, is a little bit boring in terms of the uh, date just line and variety, but look at look at the way it plays with the light. Look at that rich gold. It, it really is, it's still a stylish watch. It's gonna look good now as it always has been. Um, and I think that is one of the massive advantages of the Datejust. It's stylistically a classic. And when things are classic, they transcend time. And I'm, you know, pun not intended. I, I literally mean that the very first 1945 Datejust looks just as good now, you know. And I feel some of that rubs off again, as you come to expect, because the, the, the Tudor is so based on the the Rolex, we have that almost identical oyster case, almost identical uh, screw down crown there. Here with the smooth bezel, it's a little bit more subdued. You don't get as much variety uh, in terms of options. You do get some staggeringly beautiful dials with all kinds of different numerals. There's even a California dial. And I love the attention to detail with the little Tudor logo applied. Uh, this, this sunburst effect here. It's almost the champagne, but it's, its you know, it's obviously silver. It's a very, very classic look that's also not going to age terribly. It's its always going to be desirable. But on the other hand, it keeps it under the shadow of Rolex. Uh, it's a gift and a curse, really is. Um, I love it personally. I, I, you know, out of the two, my wife loves the two-tone because she can match it with her jewellery much more easily. And I love the stainless steel look because it's... Um, it's very understated. It's um, and obviously a lot more affordable than a uh, you know precious metal solid gold Rolex date just day date. Sorry. Okay, let's move on to versatility. Well, there's no doubt here that the Rolex date just gets a ten out of ten. We mentioned so many different uh, variations. It's it's difficult to beat. It's not just the the variety you have to choose from. It's also its versatility in the real world. With that 100 meter water resistant with the screw down crown, it's a watch that can fit all occasions. And they do share this. They're both 36 millimeter in size. Uh, the Rolex now even more versatile because you can get the larger date just and to a certain degree the Tudor Glamour that's replaced the date date uh, is also a little bit bigger. They're the same scale, these two, both around about 10 millimeters tall, the same lug width, 20 millimeters. They're just incredibly easy to match with straps and, you know, even NATO straps, whatever you want. Uh, you could even pop them on a the rubber strap, no problem. They have that kind of sporty DNA with the Oyster case, that uh, reliable ruggedness the movements can take a knocking but the, the clear winner is the rolex just because of the sheer amount of choice you have when buying one the choice really is limitless it's endless but i have to say if you had to have just one watch both of these would be extremely strong contenders and i guess that's why we are uh, dueling them today so let's move on to performance well there's no surprise we get the same marks and 
Same marks, in my opinion, all the way through. The Rolex is the winner here. It's chronometer to certified. It has the performance that uh, all automatic watches aspire to. We have an extra 10 hours of power reserve with the 48 hour power reserve. So it has to get a 10 out of 10. The Tudor, um, very similar. You know, we got the same water resistance, uh, slightly lower power reserve, but it's not chronometer certified, although it's very capable if you regulate it of performing with such uh, accuracy so i think it still gets a really solid respectable eight let's move down to durability again we have uh, a little bit more of robustness with the 3135 movement in my opinion we got that uh, niverox hairspring and slightly more shock resistant as well they both have sapphire glass which is one thing that is great about these particular versions uh, in their respective ranges and they both have that uh, the same water resistance. The Tudor lags slightly behind, mainly due to the added complication. While it is more practical for every day, certainly makes for a more versatile watch. It's an extra little thing that has a chance of going wrong. Very, very minor detail, but it has to be said. You know, this is why if you look at the Rolex Explorer with no date, you know, the, the less complications, the less chance of, of something going wrong. So I think only one point difference between them. They both are extremely rugged watches, uh, which is quite surprising because typically we see these watches as being more dressy. So let's move down to the final category. And it is, of course, X Factor, that inexplicable quality that just sets them apart. Difficult to pin down. But here again, the Rolex storms ahead, mainly due to its kind of cinematic and iconic status. The date just is respected and a movie star. Uh, if you remember the American Psycho date just I looked at, it's been in countless movies. It's a pop culture icon. It almost encapsulates the whole loads of money, 80s yuppie, synonymous with that entire era to a certain extent, but yet still going strong, just with slight uh, tweaks in its evolution. It's still as relevant today. Uh, so it has that X factor in bucket loads uh, from the one given to Churchill to the ones worn in movies another favorite is is harrison ford's stainless steel version in frantic one of my favorite polanski movies it's a movie star it's a horological icon a watch that has a first to its name and that means a lot so the x factor is without a doubt 10 out of 10 it's what a lot of watches and brands aspire to have a watch as classic as this the tudor i think falls behind here because again, it's really piggybacking on its uh, cousin's uh, achievements. It doesn't have any movie star status. It doesn't uh, have any firsts to its name. Uh, it's still a Tudor, and that's why it still gets a, a strong seven, kind of under the radar watch. And unfortunately, you're always going to have that predicament. And it's happened to me many, many times when I've worn watches, especially Tudors like this and my previous Tudor. People ask, oh, is that a Rolex? It can be an insult. Or it can be a compliment. It depends on how you look at it. But again, it's always going to be in its shadow. I think Tudor with the glamour, as you saw earlier, have tried to make it more its own thing. And I kind of respect that, but it, it will never have the X factor the date just has. Uh, so I think a, a seven is, is, is still respectable. For me, uh, the name Tudor does mean something. Tudor Royal Dynasty that uh, Hans Waldorf named the brand after is important to me. Being British, being born in London, it's something that does mean something. Um, so it still gets a strong seven. Anyway, guys, let's move the Opinel move this up slightly so the final scores are da, 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 da. well a 94 for the date just uh, obviously it won there and uh, a respectable 79 for the Tudor uh, still a good score despite costing twice as much is it twice a better watch than the Tudor probably not I don't think so but it certainly scores higher anyway guys I'm gonna leave it there so please do let me know your scores down below I'd love to hear uh, what you gave each watch 
Uh, which watch would you choose if you had to choose between them? So thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.